and we'll get to the slides on First Chronicles uh, in, in a moment. But remember Jesus said to the leaders, religious leaders, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you find life. And I'll tell you, they are these that testify of me. And so we came last week wrapping up First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, and uh, and we're going to look tonight at this uh, list of the of the prophets, uh, the kings of of Judah, of Israel and Judah, and then you'll see off to the side the, what was going on uh, internationally among the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians. So let's just take a a brief look at this. I hope you'll. Hang on to this. If you have a smartphone or a tablet and you like to keep things on there, I have this available in a PDF format. <clears throat> Would be glad if you let me know, let Linda know. We'll shoot you an email with the PDF of this. Uh, I like to have this kind of thing uh, on me as a good reference. I'll just I'll open it up in my little phone and my iBooks, which is a PDF reader, and I can look at this. It's just a good a good tool to have because you're you're talking about a lot of history here, a lot of details. But look look at this. The 10th century, of course, would have been the 900s. And so, if you look at the, uh, at the column that has all the kings listed, notice, just a reminder, under the kings of Israel, they were, they were all bad. There was, not, there was not a commendable king in the northern kingdom. And from, from Jeroboam all the way down to Hosea, uh, and you see the, the time of their reign. But I want you to notice the... the uh, the names written beside that, these in the colors, these are the prophets. And you can, you can identify. You may not have ever seen this visually before. If you wonder, the book of Obadiah, when did Obadiah prophesy? Well, he prophesied during the reign of Jehoram uh, and Jehu in the northern kingdom. But also notice uh, he prophesied in the, in the southern kingdom, the kings of Judah. One of the things I want to point out to you is that these, these six prophets in the northern kingdom all prophesied in the southern kingdom as well, the kingdom of Judah. When you look down at Judah, you notice that there were, there were eight good kings, and the good kings have, a, have the word good written beside them, Asa being one, Jehoshaphat being one, uh, Joash, uh, Amaziah, uh, Azariah, or, or Uzziah, we would know him, um, and then uh, Jotham, Hezekiah, uh, Josiah, who was the boy king, and you just look down and you see the connection. You can, you can visually see. If you've ever wondered when you're reading through the Scripture or studying something, well, when did, when did Isaiah uh, prophesy? He was an 8th century prophet, and he prophesied in the northern kingdom uh, during the, the time of, from, from Shalom down to Hosea, and then in the southern kingdom from Azariah uh, all the way down through Manasseh. And so, uh, and I want to point out something when you, when you read uh, uh, in his prophecy in, in chapter 6, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died. Notice, uh, Uzziah was a boyhood friend of, of Isaiah's, and, and he died uh, during Isaiah's reign. So just to give you a visual, now let's move over a little bit, and you see the, it all flows all the way down to the 70-year captivity of 586 to 516 B.C., which is where... Second Samuel ends. Notice what was going on in, in, in Assyria. You see the names of the Assyrian kings when they ruled. And so, uh, so when you see the captivity that occurs, uh, when the northern kingdom is carried off into captivity uh, by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., you'll notice that Shalmaneser V is finishing up his reign. Sargon II begins his reign. And then the same thing when the, uh, when the southern kingdom is carried off into, into captivity in 586 B.C. You'll notice there the, uh, the reigns of, uh, of, of Nebuchadnezzar going on then and the blueprint and then, and then Belshazzar as well. And then, of course, you see the, uh, the, the Persian kings, and, and it's under the Persian kings that, that the people are allowed to go back to return. And so I wanted you to have this visual. Do you have any questions about this? This is just something I want you to have in your hands. As I said, I have it in a PDF if you want to put it on a tablet or a phone to keep it handy uh, to visually let you see. So when you're reading, when we're studying in the, in the future and we get into the prophets as we're heading into these, uh, the summaries of each of these books, you can have something like this and look at it and say, okay. So I kind of get an idea 
of, of the time frame when, uh, when say, Amos uh, prophesied. And uh, we'll be moving through that. Any questions or comments or observations you have about this handout? Okay. No? Well, let's move over then into our uh, consideration of the Chronicles. Beginning tonight, First Chronicles, I would remind you, that, and you're going to see this in the video in a few minutes, uh, that Chronicles is one, one uh, record, and it's broken up uh, because of scroll size into what we would look, recognize as First and Second Chronicles. It is a history of the Davidic covenant. I want you to stand with me. I want to read these verses. You'll see these verses again a little later in our study tonight, but I want you to get a flavor of uh, First Chronicles. It's the same kind of history. We're going to go over similar history that we've been going over, but this time it's, it's history written from a more divine perspective to tell about God's covenantal plans for his people. First Chronicles 17, 11 to 14. When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from him who was before you. But I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. Now, hang on to that and look at First Chronicles 29, 11. This praise that goes up to God. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. What we've just read together, we've just read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. When you read 1 Chronicles 29 11, you cannot help but think of the Revelation, the book of the Revelation, where this praise just rolls up to God in, in powerful expression. And this was also the attitude of those when you see history as it is, his, that is God's, his story, and you see the unfolding of God's divine plan never thwarted throughout all of history. So thank you. Let's uh, be seated and let's, let me give you a little brief snapshot, but introduction to this. And then we're going to look at the uh, Bible Project video of uh, Chronicles. The books of First and Second Chronicles cover the same period of Jewish history described in Second Samuel through Second Kings. So you, you, from Second Samuel, First Kings, Second Kings. But the perspective of Chronicles is different. It's not just a repetition of the same thing we've studied. It's more rather a divine editorial on the history of God's people. One writer observed that 2 Samuel and Kings give political history of Israel and Judah. Chronicles gives a religious history of the Davidic dynasty of Judah. 2 Samuel and the Kings were written from a prophetic and moral viewpoint. This one was studied not from a priestly and spiritual perspective. The book of First Chronicles, which we're looking at tonight, begins with the royal line of David and then traces the spiritual significance of David's righteous reign. So let's take a moment now and watch the Bible Project video on the Chronicles. The books of First and Second Chronicles. While they're two separate books in our Bibles, that division is not original. Due to scroll length, the book was divided in two, but it was written as one book with one coherent storyline. Now, in our English Bibles, Chronicles comes after the books of Samuel and Kings, and most of Chronicles is actually repeat content from those books. And so most modern readers, when they come to Chronicles, they think, wait a minute, I just read all of this, and so they skip it. And that's a shame, because this book is really unique and important important in the Bible. In the traditional Jewish ordering of the Bible, Chronicles is actually the last book because it summarizes all of the Jewish scriptures. The first word in the book is Adam, the first character at the beginning of the story, and then the last paragraph announces the return of Israel from exile. Now we don't know who wrote this book, but we can tell from details within it, it was produced by somebody who lived a couple hundred years after the Israelites returned from the Babylonian exile. Now for this author, Jerusalem and the temple were rebuilt some time ago, and as we learned from Ezra and Nehemiah, 
things were not going well. The great prophetic hope was that the city and the temple would be rebuilt, that God would come to live among his people, the messianic king would come, and all the nations would come live under his peaceful rule, and none of that has happened. And so the author of Chronicles has reshaped these stories of David and Solomon and the kings of the past in order to provide a message of hope for the future. And we'll see that he's designed this book to emphasize two clear themes. First, the hope of the coming messianic king, and second, the hope for a new temple. Let's just dive in and you'll see these themes all over the book. First Chronicles begins with nine chapters of genealogies, long lists of names. And you'll read these and think that this is kind of boring, and that may be true for you, but actually they're very, very important. The author is summarizing here the whole storyline of the Old Testament by naming all of the key characters in the stories. And as he does so, he shapes the genealogies to emphasize two key lineages. First is the line of the promised messianic king. So lots of space is dedicated to tracing the line of Judah that led all the way to King David, to whom the messianic promise was given. And then from David, the author traces that line up into his own day. The other family line that receives lots of attention here is that of the priesthood, the descendants of Aaron, who of course served in the temple. And so right from the start, you can see the two main themes, the author's hope of the Messiah coming to build a new temple, and it's rooted in these ancient genealogies. Now after that, the author moves into the stories about David, and most of these are going to be familiar to you from the book of Samuel, but again, there's some really important differences. So first of all, the author leaves out all of the negative stories about David where he's portrayed as weak or immoral. So Saul chasing David around the desert and persecuting him, the story of David's adultery with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband, all of that is gone. And what's left are the stories that portray David as a good guy. And not only that, there's also new additional material that you won't find in the book of Samuel that shows David in a very positive light. So there's a large block of chapters where David makes preparations for the temple. He arranges resources and builders and Levites and choirs. And not only that, the author also portrays David as a Moses-like figure. God gives David plans for building the temple just as he gave plans to Moses for building the tabernacle. So why all this new material about David? The author's not trying to hide David's flaws. He knows that anybody can go read about them in the book of Samuel. Rather, he's trying to portray David as the ideal king in order to make him an image or a type of the future Messiah from the line of David. It's very similar to how Jeremiah or Ezekiel spoke of the coming Messiah as a new David. This is most clear in how the author retells the story of God's covenant promise to David in 1 Chronicles 17. And when you compare this story with its parallel in 2 Samuel 7, you'll see that the author of Chronicles is highlighting that neither David nor Solomon nor any of the kings from his line were the messianic king, and that when the Messiah does come, he will be a king like David. And so for this author, these stories about David from the past are what sustain his hope for the future. After David dies, we move into 2 Chronicles, which focuses on the kings that lived in Jerusalem. And again, there's lots of overlap with 1 and 2 Kings, but there are many key differences. So the author has left out all of the stories about the kings of northern Israel so he can just focus on the line of David. And there's lots of new material about these kings from David's line. He highlights the kings that were obedient to God, and he adds new stories about how their obedience led to success and God's blessing. But he also adds new stories about kings who were unfaithful to God. They didn't follow the Torah, they led Israel to worship idols, and these kings face horrible consequences all leading up to Israel's exile, a mess of their own making. And so this whole section becomes a series of character studies where the author wants later generations of Israelites to learn from their family history and so become faithful to their God and the Torah. Now the book's conclusion is really unique too. At the very end of the book, the king of the Persians is named Cyrus, and he tells the Israelites that they can go back home, return from exile, rebuild the city and the temple. And he says, last line of the book, whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. And that's how the book ends, with an incomplete sentence. 
Now, of course, the author knows about the first return from exile and the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, but clearly in his view, the prophetic hopes of Israel were not fulfilled in those events. And so this incomplete ending shows that the author's hope is set on yet another return from exile, when the Messiah will finally come to rebuild the temple and restore God's people. And so the book of Chronicles, it's the final book of the Jewish scriptures, it ends by pointing forward. It calls God's people to look back in order to look ahead because the past has become the source of hope for the future. So Chronicles concludes the Old Testament as a story in search of an ending. And that's what this book is all about. Again, next Sunday night when we focus on 2 Chronicles, but it gives you a good uh, picture, uh, I think in a very effective way, to see the movement of God. And it's interesting that uh, I find it fascinating that 2 Chronicles ends an incomplete sentence because the story is not complete. The story of God's plans uh, for his people and with his people are not complete. So it retraces the history of, of Israel up until the return from captivity. So you see, we're moving, we're moving forward uh, at a fairly good pace. When we hit the poetic books, we'll take a little different uh, angle on things, then we'll move into the, to the prophets and, and kind of piecemeal back through where we are now. The, uh, the book uh, is dedicated to the life of David. It begins with his royal line. I think we have that uh, there for you, this, this breakdown as far as how it, how it goes. Uh, it opens up with the genealogies of David and Israel, uh, with the primary topics being the uh, ancestry. Where did David come from? And, uh, and the time for that, it's a time span that is going back through of over of a thousand years, for about a thousand years. And then it focuses in on the, on the second part of the actual reign of David. And like they pointed out in the video, this is not so much designed to be a, a detailed history of David flaws and all. It is designed to show that David, the man after God's own heart, is the one who, who is sort of the precursor. Uh, he's the, he foreshadows uh, the Messianic king, the, the ultimate son of David. This reign of David uh, traces through his the accession as as king. He's uh, actually seven years king when they when they speak about him here. Uh, the acquiring of the ark uh, out of its captivity, the various victories of David, and then a lot of time is spent in the detail of preparation of the temple, which David himself uh, is never finally allowed to build. And the primary topics in this portion of the of First Chronicles are the history and activity. Um, when you look at the introduction and the title of it, the title itself is a big, long, multisyllabic term uh, in Hebrew. The meaning of it, though, is the words of the days. So it's the words, it's the story about these specific Days. It would be, if some, one writer I read said it would be like calling, I tell them the events of the times. The events of the times. Just a little history for you in terms of the format of the book. Uh, it was divided into two parts in 3rd century B.C. Uh, when, the, when the Hebrew Bible, we've talked about this before, was translated into a Greek translation, the, uh, the Septuagint, uh, so that the Greek world could read the Hebrew Bible in their own native tongue. Uh, and when it, was, when it was done, when it was translated into Greek, it was given the name that would be the same as of things omitted, referring to some omissions from the stories of, the, of Samuel, the stories of the kings. Uh, and some, some copies have actually been found with the name equivalent of the... Uh, the first book, or not the first, but the, concerning the kings of Judah. That's what I was going to say. Concerning the kings of Judah. So this, the story of the line of David through, through the kings. We get our name for it. Chronicles, if you wonder, well, where did that come from in the light of what you've just told us about the Hebrew uh, name and the Greek name? Our name comes from the, from the Latin version of this, Jerome's Latin Vulgate. 
uh, which was written 385 to 405 AD. The, the Chronicorum Liber, in other words, the Chronicles of the Whole Sacred History is, the, is what the name was given in, in Latin. We do not know exactly who the author is, uh, but there is tradition that points to Ezra the priest uh, as the author. He lived in the time frame where this would have been written. Uh, having a priestly background, he would have been interested in showing the history of Israel from that priestly perspective. Because think about it right now, by the time we move through these histories, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you have seen the kings in a, in a high profile. You've begun to see the prophets, the introduction of the prophets, and now you're seeing the priestly role. And so Jesus Christ, our Messiah, is the fulfillment of all of these. He is prophet, priest, and king in his, what, what the old writers called, in his offices. He fulfills the offices of prophet, priest, and king. He is the prophet who, he is that prophet who teaches us the word and will of God. Uh, he is a priest because he comes before God to offer sacrifice on our behalf, and he is the king because he is the son of David. He rules over. So you've, you've seen the, these three offices increasingly highlighted. You're going to see it in the designated books of the prophets themselves, but you're seeing this as foreshadowing of the, of the ultimate son of David who will represent all three. Uh, and so some have posed that the books of Chronicles, First, Second Chronicles, and the book of Ezra comprise one consecutive history, very much like the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, both written by, by Dr. Luke. What we know of Ezra is he was educated as a scribe. Um, he was, uh, we know that Nehemiah uh, collected an extensive library which was available to Ezra uh, when he was, for his use when he was compiling chronicles, if he's indeed the one who did. Some scholars in Israel uh, accumulated and compared historical material, and the author of Chronicles was actually a compiler who drew from many sources under the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of good historical data that would lead us to draw a what we call a reasonable conclusion that perhaps Ezra is the author. As far as the date uh, and the setting, we told you that the genealogies in chapters 1 through 9 trace back to Adam, uh, all the way from Adam to the time of David. Uh, chapter, and this is about a thousand years, and then chapters uh, 10 to 29 focus on the 33 years of David's rule over the, over the united kingdoms which were divided after his, after his death, and, and, the, and the great division began to break out. But they extend, the genealogies actually extend further than this into 500 B.C. when you pick up names like Zerubbabel, who's the grandson of King Jeconiah. Uh, Zerubbabel leads the first return of the Jews from exile in 538 B.C. And then Zerubbabel's two grandsons, Pelatiah and Josiah. Uh, when you see these names pop up and you know historically the timeline of where they were, then you see that this, the, it, it goes forward. So you know this was written uh, after the return from captivity. Uh, some writers believe that Ezra probably completed, if he's the author, Chronicles between 450 and 430 B.C., and addressed it to the returned remnant, as our videos mentioned, to give them hope. Think about what they came back to. They came back to, to utter devastation. They came back to an incredibly daunting task to try to rebuild uh, the holy city. And so uh, it is surmised that, that this story, this divine story, this story from a priestly perspective, uh, that the promise and, and the observation that uh, will come up in Second Chronicles, that, that none of these kings were the king. None of the ones who, who followed David were the king, but that there was a king yet to come. And you, you picked that up. We're going to see it again in one of, the, uh, one of the key verses. The description there that is given cannot be of any of the kings that served, any of the kings that's on the list of the timeline that I gave you. We know that uh, Ezra, Ezra leads some of the exiles to Jerusalem in 457 B.C. Uh, Nehemiah was the political leader during this time. Malachi, the, the, the moral leader. Uh, and so 
we find in this first Chronicles that there's a disproportionate time spent, hardly any mention, like maybe one chapter mention of, of Saul, but a disproportional amount of time spent on David and Solomon uh, because it's, David is the archetypical king and Solomon ruled in the splendor, in the splendor of, of the glory of the, of the nation. Now, I think that's enough background. What about the theme and the purpose? I've already told you that it was written from a different perspective. Some of the same history, but history told a little differently. And you need to know that that's what happens. I, I'm think, thinking about when I was in seminary, I had a professor. He's since gone home to be with the Lord. But he wrote Baptist history. And, uh, and the way he wrote it really diminished the rich uh, theological heritage uh, that Baptists, Southern Baptists particularly, have. And so... Uh, we challenged him one time on some of his historical data uh, and challenging the accuracy of it in terms of, in terms of the historic theological perspective of Southern Baptist. And his response was, well, I, I write history from a, from a sociological perspective. And what he was saying was, you can't hold me accountable for the theology in that because I'm not emphasizing theology. I'm emphasizing sociological movements. And, but when you, when you read his history that he wrote, uh, he did a lot of that, but he also, in that, discounted some of the theological bases for Southern Baptists to exist and for our mission um, operation to be, to be fueled by the gospel. Uh, so people write from different perspectives. Chronicles is written not to give us uh, blow by blow of what's happening as king follows king, and in, in the case of the kings of, of the northern kingdom in Israel, tragedy follows tragedy, uh, murder and death and mayhem. But it's written rather to give hope. It's writing back to the people, the remnant who's returned from captivity to say it's not over. You may look at your city, the temple utterly destroyed, the walls torn completely down, and you may think it's over. But we want to tell you the history from the vantage point of it's not over. It's not over. It's still, still yet to come. God has still to bring on the scene his Messiah, his son of David. None of these were. So don't look at them and say this was failure. Look at the future. Look at what's coming. And that's, that's really the perspective that Chronicles gives. And you can't, if you're not careful, you'll get bogged down in genealogies. You'll get bogged down in all the details, the minutia of, of the temple plan. Uh, just like when we were reading through the, the stories about the tabernacle and all that had to, be, had to go into that. But you've got to move through that and recognize that, that these details, God's detail in genealogies, his detail in plans for tabernacles and temples, tell us what? He is a God concerned about details. He's not a God of generalities. And that ought to be very encouraging to us if we want to know him personally, if we want others to know him personally. He is the big, sovereign, overruling God, but he is the God who deals in the details as well. And so you learn that when you read these, these very meticulous accounts of things like genealogies and, and temple plans. The readers needed encouragement in rebuilding their heritage. It wasn't just the physical walls. It wasn't just the physical temple. It was the, it was the recovery of the identity of the Jews as a people because it was out of the Jews, God's special people, that Messiah was going to come, and when they were decimated like they were uh, and taken from their land and, and uh, bred in captivity to come back, how can we even identify as a people? And Chronicles was written to encourage them that Yahweh is still with them, that the fact that he brought them back and enabled them to begin to undertake the building of the temple meant that all was not lost. There's this word, this name, Ichabod, uh, and it's, when you break it down, it's, it's Ichabod, it's glory uh, no more, or glory departed. And even though they had experienced something of the glory departing from them, uh, God had not departed them. Uh, God still had a future for them, even if they were under Gentile powers. Fast forward now, just real quickly, into the days of Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene in the first century. The Jews are what? Are they a free people? No, they're under Roman rule when Jesus comes. One of his encounters he has 
is when the Pharisees are in incredible <laughs> denial. When they say to him, I think it's in John 8, we've never been in bondage to anyone. Think about how you have to rewrite Jewish history to get there. And even as they said that, in John's gospel, to Jesus, you could hear Roman soldiers marching by, occupying the Palestinian territory. So they, they needed to know God had a future for them. The throne of David was not there physically, but the line of David still stood intact, and God's plan to bring the son of David on the scene uh, was, was still going to unfold. You find in Chronicles, one of the emphasis in Chronicles is the role of the law, uh, the Torah, uh, the priesthood, the temple. The second temple, not Solomon's temple, but now the second temple, uh, could be regarded as the remnants linked to the first, a reminder of the former glory, former splendor. And they were also, this, uh, I think the fellows in the video said, it's quite a lot of character studies. That the past has lessons that need to be learned. One of them being, it takes more than being anointed as king to be kingly. They need to be careful in terms of, in terms of who they follow. They, they learned that apostasy idolatry, intermarriage with Gentiles, absence of unity, that, that these are the reasons you could trace back to their ruin. This is why the Lord allowed them to go into a captivity. One writer observed, and I hadn't thought about this until I read this, it is significant that after the exile, when they've been carried off uh, northern kingdom by the Assyrians, southern kingdom by the Babylonians, after the exile, when they returned from exile, Israel never again worshipped foreign gods. They learned their lesson. Now, Jesus would call them idolatrous because of the idols in their hearts, but they were a, they were a monotheistic people. They never again built the Asherahs. They never again brought in the Baals. They never embraced the, the gods of the cultures around them. They were followers of the one true God, Yahweh. Now, so what about, uh, if you look for a key word or key term, I said to you in the title, it is the Davidic covenant. All of this chronicles is all seen through the promise of God about giving a son. He gave that promise to David. But I want you to see in, in this passage in 1 Chronicles where it really stands out. 1 Chronicles 17, 11 to 14. Now, writing history, looking back at it, after the exile, this is recorded, what God said to his people. When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers. In other words, when you die, David, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. Clearly, these, these kings that followed, God was not establishing their kingdom. They would, they would rise and fall, rise and fall. A sin by treachery, die at the hand of other people being treacherous. He shall build a house for me. Well, they, you would read that and think the physical temple. But Jesus, by his blood and righteousness, built something better than that. By his blood and righteousness and his saving us by grace through faith, guess what? He, he is making us a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are living stones. The temple Jesus came to build is this temple that honors God. I told you before when we were studying aspects of the temple in earlier studies in the evening, John Owen, uh, the, the peerless Puritan, said in commenting on Peter's passage where he talks about us being living stones, as you come to him, uh, the living stone, you are being built up as living stones. He said this living stone Christ will not allow, he said he used the word admit, in other words, he will not allow any dead members in the building that he is building. In other words, it's all made up of sinners saved by grace. That's the unifying, the common reality. It's a spiritual temple. It's very much like what, what Paul discovered when he was 
schooled by the Spirit in the Arabian desert, and he comes back in Romans 9, and he makes this statement. It's one of the most amazing things he says. It really is the key to the whole book of Romans. It's not as though the Word of God had failed. For not all who are of Israel are Israel. Paul had to learn that the, that the Israel that God is building through the person work of Jesus Christ is a spiritual Israel, which cannot be destroyed, cannot be negated, obliterated. And so this is where Chronicles is talking about this spiritual. Look on now. He shall build a house for me. And I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father. And he shall be to me a son. You could, you could look at the lines of the kings that followed David. And, and though they may have mouthed on their lips that Yahweh was their God, you see by their lives that there was no way that he was their father. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who was before you. Talking about Saul there. When he removed the, the overruling, overshadowing presence of his spirit on the life of Saul. He said, I will not take my spirit from my son. But I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. This is the message of Chronicles. To say to the people, don't look to the torn down temple. Don't look to the decimation of the throne. Look forward to a day when a throne will be established forever. Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And as surely as I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He was going back to his Father and taking all of his people with him to have this spiritual building that would be precious. Another verse that we read earlier, 29, 11, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness. Here, here's, the, here's the response that the people are taught to give to God. Having s experienced exile, seen the decimation, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head above all. Chronicles was written to teach these people that you do not walk by what you see. You walk by faith in the promises of God. And so it's, it's instructing the people to have hope. The, uh, someone has suggested that the key chapter in the book is chapter 17. One of, the, one of the key pivotal passages for really all of Scripture. We know that we have the Davidic covenant. We looked at it when we studied 2 Samuel 7. It's is where the Davidic covenant is laid out. First Chronicles 17 gives it to us again. You'll be established in the house of God forever. The, the psalmist David said this in the 23rd Psalm toward the end of his life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever or for length of days. And so uh, this promise of God to confirm him in my house and in my kingdom, to confirm the Messiah. Well, what about Jesus Christ in First Chronicles? Well, of course, anytime you're talking about the life of David, you know he foreshadows the life of Jesus Christ. But the emphasis on the Davidic covenant, the promise of a son whose throne would be established forever, who would rule and reign in the kingdom of God unceasingly, points to the coming Messiah. It's interesting that uh, the tribe of Judah uh, is placed first in the national genealogy in 1 Chronicles because the monarchy and the temple and the Messiah come from Judah. Look at G Genesis 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. In other words, the, the ruling authority. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet till tribute comes to him. 
and to him shall be the obedience of the people. See, you read passages like that. If you're taught passages like that growing up as a Jew and you're let off into captivity, you wonder, how can that be true? How, how could the scepter not depart when we have seen the Babylonians crush the scepter of Judah? The answer is it, it is still true because the ultimate offspring of Judah has not held the scepter yet. And when he does, then there will be no ceasing from that. It all comes from the tribe of Judah. The writers pointed out, or the video pointed out, that, that it's the last, Chronicles constitutes the last books in the Hebrew Bible. The genealogies in First Chronicles, if you can imagine them sitting at the end of, of what we know to be the Old Testament, are a preamble to the genealogy of Christ in the first book of the New Testament. It would be more obvious if you saw, saw that visually. One writer said this about the contribution of Chronicles. said, what Deuteronomy is to the rest of the Pentateuch, in other words, to the rest of the five books of Moses, and what John is to the Gospels, Chronicles is to Israel's history in Samuel and Kings. Although there's overlap, Chronicles emphasizes some things differently than Samuel and Kings. And I want to I go over that with you just briefly. Samuel, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, so for, for brevity's sake, I'm going to say Samuel and Kings emphasizes the continuation of Israel's history from the United Kingdom to the two captivities. You, you see Israel, as we recognize it, ceasing. Chronicles focuses on the southern kingdom and the Davidic line, so it's, it's more zeroed in on, on the whole issue of David. David's lineage, David's offspring, the promise of God to David in the covenant. Samuel and Kings on political history, Chronicles on religious history. The prophetic authorship of Samuel and Kings emphasizes the prophetic ministry and the moral concerns. Remember, we talked about the authors of those books. The priestly authorship of, uh, of Chronicles emphasizes the priestly ministry and the spiritual concerns. We noted when we were studying Samuel and Kings that that these documents were written by authors soon after the events, but in Chronicles, it's written perhaps by Ezra many years after to encourage the people. Samuel and Kings focused on the more negative, the, the rebellion, the tragedy. Chronicles focuses upon the, more the positive. Uh, there is apostasy, it doesn't deny it, but it also points out hope in the midst of that. Samuel and Kings is primarily a message of judgment. What happens when you turn your back on God? You get carried off into captivity. He gives you uh, poor leaders. Chronicles is a message of hope to be restored out of the ashes. Samuel and Kings focus on man's failings. They're character sketches of bad characters. Chronicles focuses on God's faithfulness. And then finally, I've said this before, Samuel and Kings focuses on kings and prophets. Chronicles on the temple and the priesthood. One writer made this observation, and I'll close with this. It says, the English Bible follows the arrangement of the Septuagint, the, the Greek uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible by placing Chronicles after Kings, okay? But Chronicles appears at the end of the Hebrew Bible. Thus, the, the genealogy spoken of of Abel to Zechariah, that's in, in Matthew's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel, is like saying Genesis to Chronicles. It's the equivalent of our saying Genesis to Malachi. The, the idea that Abel to Zechariah represents the time period of Genesis to Chronicles. And so that's a brief overview to hope puts into context the other books we've been studying. Next week we'll come back, Lord willing, we will look at Second Chronicles, do some more of this, let you see the video again, that some more of that might sink in, and, and get, the, get pictures in your mind of where this fits and where we see Jesus Christ. And I hope by the time that we're doing this now, look at the books we've studied, that you're, that you're increasingly learning to see these figures, to see promises, uh, to see 
events, uh, hopeful and tragic, to see in and through them how God uses them in his history to point us to Christ, the son of David, the king. I remind you of the catechism. We're going to close with this tonight. We ask our children as we catechize them. What offices did Jesus Christ undertake? He undertook the office of prophet, priest, and king. And we ask him what each of those offices means, and they tell us. Then we ask him, why do you need a prophet? The children are taught in the catechetical answer to say, because I'm ignorant. In other words, I need to be taught. I, I don't know everything. That's a, that'd be a good lesson for this generation of, of folks running around protesting to just stop and acknowledge, you know, I may not know everything. I'm ignorant. Why do you need a priest? Because I'm sinful. Why do you need a king? Because I'm weak and helpless. Because you see, Jesus, as a prophet, teaches us the will of God. We learn from his word. We learn from his life what God's will looks like, how to do his will. I mentioned when we had the Good Friday service a couple of Fridays ago, one writer whom I greatly admire said, Jesus Christ was the law walking. If you want to see what the Ten Commandments looks like, fleshed out. Look at the life of Jesus Christ. He teaches us the will of God. As a priest, he prays to God for us. One of the roles of the priest was to intercede for the people. As a priest, he prays to God. He ever lives right now to make intercession at the right hand of the Father. He prays to God for us and he offers sacrifice on our behalf. And as the priest, he not only offered the sacrifice, he offered himself as a sacrifice. He was both priest and lamb. And as a king, he rules over us and defends us. He promised, one of the last promises he gave on the Mount of Ascension, Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. The Spirit of Christ came to Paul in prison. It says, Paul, stop being afraid. Keep on preaching. No one's going to harm you. I have many people in this city. We're seeing Jesus fleshed out this way in, in the foreshadowing in the Old Testament of looking forward to Jesus when he came, prophet, priest, and king. And in 1 Chronicles, he is the ultimate, inevitable son of David who will rule and overrule so that one day we will join with the choirs in heaven and sing, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. you have any questions or comments before we dismiss tonight?